It's tragic when something bad happens to someone. Well, what if they deserve it? Okay, well then it's not so tragic. It still might have an element of tragedy, but it's really tragic if something really terrible happens to someone who clearly doesn't deserve it. So what's the most tragic story? Well, it's the worst possible thing happening to the person who least deserves it. Well, that's core to the passion story. That's for sure, right? Because not only is Christ innocent, he, he's not merely innocent. He's also good and not just good. He's as good as it gets. And yet his life is this the, the tragic, the tragedy of the passion is the worst of all possible punishments visited upon the least deserving person. But it's, it's way worse than that. That just barely begins to scrape the surface because it's torture and a terrible torture because the Romans designed crucifixion to be a terrible torture, like consciously. And so it's tragedy at the hands of your fellow man and your fellow man motivated by the spirit of Cain in the most fundamental sense. How can I inflict the most misery possible in the shortest period of time, let's say, subject to that, at a young age with foreknowledge as a consequence of betrayal by your best friend at the hands of a mob of your own people who are simultaneously under the thumb of a tyranny that's part and parcel of what's persecuting you, who persecute you knowing you're innocent, not just innocent, but also good, and who choose to punish you instead of punishing someone they know to be criminal. It's all of that. It's like the sum total of all possible fears. If you're looking for certainty, the reality of suffering is certain. I mean, what do you accept as evidence above all else? That's a good question. That's a hard question. But I would say pain is up there. It's very difficult not to believe in the reality of your own pain. Um, it's somewhat easier not to believe in the reality of other people's pain. That's not so easy either, you know. Um, but it's, your, your pain seems to be undeniably real. And so it does beg a question, which is, you know, if pain is undeniably real, is that which overcomes pain even more real? And I think that's, in some sense, that's the idea that lurks behind the idea of the resurrection. So a long while back, I had planned to do a series on Exodus. I did a ser biblical series on Genesis, which people seem to appreciate, which I found extremely useful. It was quite a privilege to have the time and the space to walk through those books and try to understand them first psychologically. And, and I like to speak about things psychologically before I would ever dare to speak about them religiously. I think you leave that for last resort in some sense. I was thinking about some of the ideas that I talked about today, um, you know, about the Bible being the foundation of the lens through which we look at the world. We have this idea that the Bible is a living text. And, you know, if we embody it, then it's a living text. That's actually accurate. And I, I think to the degree that we're avatars of the Judeo-Christian tradition, that we do embody it for better or for worse. And we're stuck with that or blessed by it or both. So I'll tell you the story. When Moses is leading the Israelites through the desert, I'm very compelled by that story. You know? So for example, one of the things that's really interesting about it is that the story begins with a tyrannical state. And then it's the spirit of God that characterizes the Hebrew longing for freedom. And that's kind of an interesting idea, you know, psychologically, you think that What's the Spirit of God? The Spirit of God is that which manifests itself within you in opposition to tyranny. Could be, you know, that's, that's not a bad idea. It's quite an idea. It's a remarkable idea. Um, and maybe it's true. It's certainly the case that that's how God is presented in that story. In, in, and in many other ways, but, but that being paramount above all. And, you know, there's, a, there's an, another corollary to that, which is... Well, we shouldn't be subjects of tyranny if we're children of God, if we're Israel, and Israel means we who struggle with God. It's not appropriate for us to be subject to tyranny. 
And that's interesting too, because I think we, we, we sort of accept that idea at face value in the West is that, yeah, slavery is wrong, obviously. It's like, it's not so bloody obvious, these things. You know, one of the things that I'm really curious about in relationship to the postmodern types who make group membership the sine qua non of existence is, why is slavery wrong? Exactly. It's like, if it's just one, if we're all groups and one group lords it over another, it's like, that's not wrong. It's just tough luck for the, for the oppressed group. It's, there's no wrong there because it's only wrong if we're sovereign individuals, right, with some intrinsic worth who are not to be subject to arbitrary tyranny. That's when it's wrong, and you have to accept all those other axioms before you get to say anything about slavery being wrong at all. Otherwise, it's just, like Marx pointed out, it's just brute economics. And so, you can make a moral judgment about that if you want, but what's your criteria for saying that it's wrong? You know, and of course, that would upset people on the radical left who want to presume that it's intrinsically wrong without having to presume all the things that you have to presume to make it intrinsically wrong, and without even noticing that that's just a sleight of hand. In any case, so that's part of that biblical narrative too. We're not the sorts of creatures who should be subject to tyranny. And then the tyranny might be, well, is it the tyranny of a state? Or is it the tyranny we impose on ourselves? And I would say probably both. Why not both? The story could be referring to both. We tyrannize ourselves with our own presuppositions all the time. And then you might ask yourself, why? Why don't we just give up our tyrannical presuppositions? You know, because they're not worthy and they're oppressive, but we don't give them up and we often celebrate them. And I think the story has an answer for that too, because it's out of the tyranny into the desert. It's like, is that better or worse? How about worse? And so what if it's the case that even to escape from the tyranny of your own presuppositions that you don't go from the tyranny to the promised land, you go from the tyranny to the desert. And who the hell, excuse me, wants to do that? And the answer is no one with any sense. It's like, hey, I'll just keep the tyranny, thank you very much. At least I know where everything belongs there. And fair enough. I mean, this is a very serious question, and it's, it's an open question in the Exodus narrative whether the desert is worse or better than the tyranny. And so, and you know, you see this in, in the real world, lots of people in the Soviet Union pined for the days of Stalin. So I read a book once that was uh, Reminiscences of a, of a of, um, Extermination Camp written by the guards, the good old days. You know, so I don't think there's a tyranny that's so brute that we can't long for it if it's been shattered. And so that's quite something, all that packed up in that story anyways. So the Israelites are out in the desert and uh, they're there for 40 years, and you might think, well, what kind of leadership do they have? It's not that big a desert. And the answer is, yeah, but you know, the desert after a tyranny, that's no bloody joke. And maybe it takes three generations to get through it. And that's possible. And so there's all that. And then the Israelites are wandering around in the desert. And what happens? Well, the same thing happened to them as is happening to us. They're worshiping false idols and they're tempted. And it's no wonder they're tempted because, well, they're in the desert. It's like it's not going so well. It's no wonder they're having a crisis of confidence, you know, and, and maybe they're pining for the old days and they're not so sure that the God who informed them that being the subjects of tyranny was wrong because now here we are in the desert. And so they lack faith and it's understandable. But despite it being understandable, and this is one of the harsh things about the story, what does God do when he hears their complaints? He sends poisonous snakes in there to bite them. I think that's pretty brutal. You know, and that's the sort of thing that make it, makes the technical atheist type sort of recoil about the conceptions of God in the Old Testament. It's not exactly what you'd expect in some sense from an all merciful being. It's like you got these poor Israelites. First of all, they were in the tyranny. Then they had to part, go across the Red Sea. Now they've been wandering around in the desert and that's not good. And so your best solution is to send a bunch of snakes in to bite them? But you think, well, you know, even if you're in the desert after a tyranny and you lose faith, then the snakes are gonna bite you, right? Because that's what happens. Because if you're in, you know, a little analog of hell and you lose your faith, is that gonna make it worse or better? 
And the answer is, well, I have reason to lose my faith. It's like, fair enough. That isn't the question. The question is, what happens if you lose it? Or you start looking for faith in the wrong directions. And the answer is, hell gets a little deeper. That's one of the things that really frightened me. I spent a lot of time studying atrocity. And one of, I realized on a metaphorical level that the reason hell is a bottomless pit is because no matter how bad it is, there is some bloody stupid thing you can do that will make it worse. <laughs> And that's right, you know, and that's, ter that's a terrifying realization to really understand that. And so, okay, poisonous snakes. And so now the Israelites are not only lost, but they're being bitten by venomous creatures. And, you know, there's an echo of the snake in the Garden of Eden in that story. And, and so finally the Israelites, they get kind of tired of being bitten by the snakes. And they go to Moses and say, you want to have a chat with God? Because you seem to be in there fairly tight with him. How about you get him to call off the snakes and maybe we'll behave a little better. How's that for a deal? And Moses says, okay, I'll see what I can do. And he goes and has a chat with God, which is no trivial matter. And God doesn't do what you'd expect because what you'd expect, like, and this would even work in terms of making it a comprehensible narrative. You'd think, okay, all right, guys, you've been bit enough, no more snakes. But that isn't what happens. And I think the reason that it doesn't happen is because there's no getting rid of the snakes. I, I think that's, the, that's also why there's a snake in the Garden of Eden, is there's just no getting rid of the snakes. You have to learn to contend with them. It's more, la it's more that. Or maybe it's better to learn to contend with snakes than it is to inhabit a world where there's no danger. Maybe it's something like that. I don't know. Anyways, God says something extremely surprising and very interesting from the perspective of a clinical psychologist. He tells Moses to cast snake in bronze and to raise it up on a staff. And the staff seems to me to be a reference to the staff of Moses. And that staff of Moses is something like the thing you put in the ground to orient yourself with. It's the staff of God too. And it's sort of like an axiom. And maybe it's like the tree of life. It's like here I stand. It's a center point. It's all of that. In any case, you put the snake up on the staff. That's also the symbol of healing, right? The physician symbol of healing, the staff with the snakes. And so it is a symbol of transformation. And partly that's because snakes shed their skin and are reborn. And so they're viewed as agents of transformation. And so that's all lurking in that symbol. And then God says, get the Israelites to go look at the snake on the staff. And then the poison won't poison them anymore. And I read that as a clinician, I thought that's really interesting because one of the things that we learned, all schools of psychotherapy learned in the last hundred years is that if you get people to voluntarily confront what makes them afraid and what makes them want to avoid, then they get better. It's curative. And so that's the message there. It's like, well, if, if something is terrifying you, pay more attention to it. And that's actually what you teach people in psychotherapy. I mean, there's a variety of psychotherapeutic techniques, but exposure is probably the cardinal technique. It's like, if I can find out what you're avoiding and get you to confront it voluntarily, you'll get better. And the reason seems to be is that if you get people to confront what they're afraid of, and sometimes what disgusts them, but what they'd like to avoid, let's say, if you get them to confront it voluntarily, that could be the future even, you know, the indeterminate future, they don't get less afraid they get braver and that's different it's not like they get accustomed to what they're looking at and they're no longer afraid that kind of happens but it isn't really what happens what really happens is they discover there's a lot more to them than they thought and so they're not as easily intimidated then and so if, if you run a clinical client through a session of exposure therapy maybe they're afraid of an elevator or something like that you get them so they'll go in the elevator and sometimes they're often women because women have anxiety disorders more often than men one of the unintended consequences of that often is they'll go home and have the fight with their husband that's been brewing for 30 years. Because they're now braver. They see themselves in a different light because they've confronted this thing that terrifies them. And so it's so interesting in that story that God's cure for the venomous serpent is voluntary exposure to the source of terror. It's so interesting that that's the case. And this is relevant to the issue of suffering, right? And confronting suffering dead on to actually Focus your attention on that which you would like to avoid. One of the scariest words ever is, if I was God, they wouldn't have been bitten in the first place, right? So they put the, they've got the serpent, the serpent's on the pole, 
but they're still going to get bit. And I think that that's what's essential about that is just because the serpent is there, it doesn't mean that everything is fixed. It now looks like- Snakes are still there. But the the transformation that takes place is the focus of the suffering becomes a symbol of faith for them. And that's obviously in the cross. Well, and part of the faith is the the faith that enables them to go look at the serpent to begin with. Absolutely. Okay, so that leads us to the next part, which is in John, because Christ says, thousands of years later that he has to be lifted up like the serpent in the wilderness. It's like, okay, what in the world is going on there? Because that's a hell of a thing for anyone to say about anything ever. And it's, <laughs> right, because what does that mean? Why would the Son of God compare himself to a serpent and why that particular serpent and that serpent in the wilderness? And uh, I knew this old idea that lurks in all sorts of stories in this corpus of stories that I talked about. You know, there's an idea that The hero rescues his father from the belly of the beast. That's a very, very old idea. And what that seems to mean to some degree is that if you you look into the abyss, then that it reacquaints you with the wisdom and possibility of your tradition. It's something like that. It forces that. It forces a maturation and a recognition of what's fundamentally important, that confrontation with what's terrifying. Well, so Christ says he has to be lifted up like the serpent in the... Wilderness, I thought, what does that mean? I thought a lot about the relationship between the serpent in the Garden of Eden and the idea of Satan, because there's an association there between those two ideas, and that's a very strange association too, because there's nothing in the, in the biblical story in Genesis that indicates that the serpent is Satan. Like that's, that's an idea that aggregates across hundreds of years or thousands of years, that equation. And I I tried to think that through. I thought, well, the snake is the thing that threatens us. And that's true biologically. Um, We're wired to be afraid of serpents, especially poisonous ones. And they've been in an antagonistic relationship with mammals for like 60 million years, very long time. But in some sense, the idea of Satan is, he's the ultimate, in serpents. And so that's why the, that equation is drawn across time. It's like, well, what threatens you? Well, snakes, yeah, they're pretty nasty. Well, there's snakes and then there's, well, the origin of snakes. So maybe you conquer a snake and that's one thing. And maybe the next thing is you go out and you find nests of snakes and you root them out. But then there's the snakes that are in the hearts of your enemies. That's a harder snake to deal with. And then there's the snake that's in your heart, and that's the hardest snake to deal with, right? And that's where the equation between the serpent and Satan comes, because the worst of all snakes is the serpent in your own heart. And so there's there's a psychologization of the idea of the predator, and it becomes something that's more spiritual, is that you're most vulnerable to the worst impulses within you, right? That's the worst predator. Okay, so there's the idea of the the concretization of the idea of the serpent becoming psychologized up into this figure of the adversary himself and that abides within you. Analogously, perhaps, is this reference that Christ makes to himself in relationship to the snake. Because I thought, well, what's the passion? If the snake is what you're afraid of in this concretized sense, then the passion is the sum total of all possible fears. I think that's right. You know, Carl Jung, he thought about the story of the passion as an archetypal tragedy. And here's what he meant by that. So imagine that you took all the tragedies that were ever written and you sort of, you distilled them so that you got the ultimate tragedy. Because the fact that you can identify a bunch of different stories as tragic means they have something in common, right? And so you could imagine you could pull out the central pattern of tragedy and we can flesh out some of what that might be. Like, it's tragic when something bad happens to someone. Well, what if they deserve it? Okay, well then it's not so tragic. It still might have an element of tragedy, but it's really tragic if something really terrible happens to someone who clearly doesn't deserve it. So what's the most tragic story? Well, it's the worst possible thing happening to the person who least deserves it. Well, that's core to the passion story. That's for sure, right? Because not only is Christ innocent, he, he's not merely innocent, he's also good. And not just good, he's as good as it gets. And yet, his life is this the, the tragic, the tragedy of the passion is the worst of all possible punishments 
visited upon the least deserving person. But it's much way worse than that. That just barely begins to scrape the surface because it's torture and a terrible torture because the Romans designed crucifixion to be a terrible torture, like consciously. And so it's tragedy at the hands of your fellow man and your fellow man motivated by the spirit of Cain in the most fundamental sense. How can I inflict the most misery possible in the shortest period of time, let's say, subject to that, at a young age with foreknowledge as a consequence of betrayal by your best friend at the hands of a mob of your own people who are simultaneously under the thumb of a tyranny that's part and parcel of what's persecuting you, who persecute you knowing you're innocent, not just innocent, but also good, and who choose to punish you instead of punishing someone they know to be criminal. It's all of that. It's like the sum total of all possible fears. And I, th I think that's right. And, and it's so interesting to me that psychologically that not speaking religiously to the degree that that's possible when speaking about such things is that our culture has put at its center an archetypal tragedy. It's as if we're attempting to inoculate ourselves against the catastrophe of life. And, but what's also so fascinating about the story of the Passion is that the crucifixion is not the end of the story. The end of the story is the resurrection. And so the implication there is the same as the implication of going into the abyss to rescue your father from the belly of the beast. It's like the tragedy isn't the end of the story. The resurrection is the end of the story. And so then you wonder what that means psychologically, because what you see in the psychotherapeutic session, in the psychotherapeutic milieu is that if you get people to expose themselves to what they're terrified of, being terrified isn't the end of the story. Recovering is the end of the story. And so that begs the question is like, well, to what degree are we capable of bearing suffering and prevailing? And the answer might be to the degree that we're capable of confronting it forthrightly. And that might actually just be true. And you know, you think, well, how could it be otherwise in some sense? Like what's gonna call the best out of you if it isn't the most, what's most challenging? Because it's not that easy to get the best called out of you. It's not gonna just happen because someone rings your doorbell, right? You have to be shook to the core before you're gonna undertake what's necessary to make the sacrifices that are required to put you in alignment. That's, that doesn't happen with no reason. So, well, so, are you grateful for your suffering as a consequence of that? I don't know, that's a high standard, man, that's a high standard.